Harry asks, what are your thoughts on a Bitcoin proof-of-work change to combat mining centralization? Lately, we've had the anonymous owner of Bitcoin.org, Cobra, uh, come out in favor of a proof-of-work change, and has been voicing concerns about Bitmain controlling ownership over three of the main Bitcoin mining pools. Um, and the quote here is, as of the last writing, at least 53% more likely of the hash rate is controlled by. Um, and they mentioned three different pools. This is a dangerous level of centralization. Is this a real concern threat to Bitcoin? And does something like a proof of work change really address the core issue of mining centralization and control, or would it only delay the inevitable? What other options would be available for Bitcoin to combat hidden pool ownership by large actors such as Bitmain, if such ownership is in fact legitimate? There are good examples of other communities trying to combat ASICs in recent times. So I would like to know why Bitcoin itself could not respond in a similar way. An example below. Um, and it goes on to you can read the question yourselves, but it goes on to talk about a recent change in the way Monero does its proof of work algorithm in response to the release of ASICs. Um, so I, I disagree. Uh, I think a, a proof of work change doesn't combat mining centralization. In fact, it's likely to make it worse. Um, you see, the thing, the thing about uh, proof of work at the moment is that the centralization is driven by economic factors that have a lot to do with how quickly Bitcoin went from being CPU mined to being GPU, FPGA, and finally ASIC mined over a period of about nine years. This meant that the hardware was being obsoleted very, very quickly, which gave enormous advantage to those who had close proximity to silicon fabrication plants and cheap electricity. And that's 99% was concentrated in particular regions of China. Um, but those um, incentives and that economic structure is pretty much over. Um, and the reason for that is that as ASICs achieved the highest level of silicon density, at about 16 nanometers, and now moving towards 12 nanometers of silicon fabrication, there is no more 1,000x performance improvement available in the le next level of silicon fabrication density. Uh, we've already hit the wall. Moore's law applies, and now you can get maybe a 2x improvement in performance over the next 18 months. And even that's doubtful, because at these levels of densities, we're reaching kind of the end of Moore's law in the traditional sense of chip density. And so, what does that mean? That means that this silicon, um, these ASICs, this equipment. Uh, when manufactured, now has a shelf life that is more than two years, not just two months. And that means that it can be deployed in many other places where there are a set of favorable conditions, which include both cheap electricity, low operating costs, but also uh, several other considerations, such as political considerations. In fact, the concentration of mining um, in China is a disadvantage for Chinese miners too, because having too much mining in one place makes you susceptible uh, to political coercion and extortion. It also increases the risks from natural disasters, electricity shortages, a fire in one of the warehouses, or some other uh, situation like that. So I expect we will see that. Um, the centralization of mining is already reversing itself. It's going to take several years until that plays out, but we're beginning to see the emergence of other manufacturers um, making ASICs and um, other locations vying and competing for this. Now, let's play the other side of the game, which is what happens if you did a change in the proof of work. First of all, that would devastate the security of the Bitcoin network. And maybe you can do it on a smaller network like Monero, uh, but quite honestly, Bitcoin security um, is the most robust level of security that exists at the moment. And a change in the proof of work would basically reset that. Um, and all of the uh, investment in ASICs would be wiped out. But that also means all of the existing security investment in Bitcoin would be wiped out. And we're talking about uh, several billion dollars of industrial-scale infrastructure that secures Bitcoin against uh, various forms of attack. And so that's not a good thing. Uh, and it's a very, I think, cavalier 
um, suggestion to simply change proof of work. Also, I don't think it would be effective. I think an attempt to change Bitcoin's proof of work would be a contentious fork that would not have majority consensus, and as a result, um, would result in a fork of Bitcoin, a contentious fork that would split Bitcoin into Bitcoin SHA-256 and Bitcoin something else. Um, and the Bitcoin something else would have a very hard time rebooting its security. Also, who do you think would reboot that security faster? So let's say the proof of work algorithm is changed, maybe made a bit more ASIC resistant. Um, well, theoretically, the very same players who have a couple billion dollars of liquid cash available to them, all of the operating expertise, uh, manufacturing pipelines, um, relationships with silicon fabrication, and access to inexpensive electricity, you think they might have an advantage in rebooting um, their entire operation and investing in the new uh, proof-of-work algorithm? Arguably, they would gain an even bigger share of the new proof-of-work algorithm uh, mining uh, and manufacturing facility, because it would set back everybody, only they would have the advantage of um, eight years of experience, two billion dollars, and existing relationships with manufacturers. So I think it would actually undo the effects of competition that we're already seeing taking hold in this space. So uh, no to a proof of work um, algorithm change. No to um, shooting Bitcoin in the foot in order to. Um, really deal with uh, a threat of centralization that I think is already uh, waning, and uh, no to giving more power to developers or other parties who make unilateral decisions about proof-of-work algorithm and split the consensus of the network. Is, hard, is a hard fork still a valid option in case of emergency? In case it's needed to hard, hard fork Bitcoin for any reason, is that still a valid option? Now that Bitcoin has started to have a lot of users, would that not be a big mess? And in your opinion, what threat or event could lead to a hard fork? Thanks. So, Zell, I think the uh, question here really comes down to what we mean by a hard fork. A hard fork in itself is not uh, necessarily a bad or disruptive thing. A hard fork, if properly planned and supported by a majority of the um, system, meaning the economic actors, the users, the merchants, the exchanges, the wallets, the miners, everybody is on board, everybody agrees this needs to happen, or at least the vast majority um, of the participants in the system agree that a hard fork needs to happen. And it's planned, and people are uh, willing to put in the effort to upgrade their software clients so as to effectuate a fork. And it's properly executed and well developed and high quality code is produced. Then a hard fork can be done, and it can be done effectively, and it can be done with a minimum amount of disruption. Um, you know, there are some uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains that regularly do uh, hard forks, either to respond to problems, um, as we've seen with, for example, denial of service um, attacks in the Ethereum network that involved uh, poorly chosen values for gas, and in that case, um, Tangerine Whistle and Spurious Dragon, which are some funny names for a couple of the hard forks that were introduced to solve those problems, were executed very effectively and on a fairly tight timeline. There are other blockchains that have regularly scheduled hard forks every six months in order to introduce new features that are backwards incompatible. That's generally not the development culture in Bitcoin. And, um, Bitcoin has a much more conservative approach to its software management, uh, probably because there's a lot more at stake and it's a much much bigger uh, economy and user community. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that a hard fork can't be pulled off. Uh, contentious hard forks, hard forks where uh, a small part of the network uh, wants the hard fork and the majority doesn't, those are very problematic, and these can lead to chain splits, as we've seen in the past. But 
Um, let's say, for example, you ask me what threat or event could lead to a hard fork. Let's say, for example, that um, the uh, fatal flaw was discovered in SHA-256 that would very quickly lead to a compromise of the proof-of-work algorithm and a weakening of the security of the chain. It is very likely that under those circumstances there would be a broad move to uh, change the proof-of-work algorithm. Now, that would be quite disruptive. And the reason for that being very disruptive is that there is a lot of deployed infrastructure in the form of ASICs uh, that would become obsolete with that hard fork. And that would require a refresh of all of the uh, mining hardware. Now, that is not entirely impossible. And keep in mind that up to very recently, as the pace of development in ASICs um, was frenetic, many of the mining companies developed the skill of being able to completely refresh the majority of their ASIC infrastructure every six months, because those ASICs were uh, basically becoming obsolete uh, within three to six months of being deployed. So um, it is not unthinkable that you might need to and be able to execute a proof of work change algorithm, and that the mining companies, if it was in their interest, would not only go along but would be able to uh, quickly refresh, um, probably within six months, their hardware infrastructure. Um, another possible event would be discovering uh, a fatal flaw in ECDSA or discovering uh, some kind of weakness, or um, discovering a more um, widely available, powerful enough uh, quantum computing system that, uh, that could start negatively impacting the security of ECDSA. Now, in cryptography, these things generally they don't happen overnight. Uh, Cryptographic algorithms like, um, that have had flaws, like, for example, the data encryption standard DES, or um, MD5, uh, or SHA-1, um, these algorithms they didn't just fall apart overnight, and they didn't go from completely robust to completely useless overnight. Instead, what happens is weaknesses were found that changed the effort required. And they changed the effort required so that um, it became feasible for very well-funded adversaries to start uh, attacking these algorithms, uh, but only over long periods of time. And still, there was plenty of time uh, for organizations to retool those algorithms. So cryptography generally, um, there are exceptions to this rule, of course, but generally speaking, cryptography weaknesses do not fatally compromise an algorithm once and for all overnight, and in such a way that everyone can break it. Instead, they weaken it, and they weaken it such that we anticipate that six months from now, uh, you can do it for less than ten million dollars and and less than a warehouse full of equipment. So we'd better start changing things up now to protect against that eventuality. Um, so in those cases, we might need to implement a hard fork. But then again, some of these problems, perhaps many of these problems, can be solved with a soft fork too. It remains to be seen. I think it's still a viable option in an emergency.